August 1st, 1974, a date that will go down in history is the day Ross Gay was born to a black father and a white mother in Youngstown, Ohio. He moved to Levittstown, Pennsylvania as a child. Gay majored in English and art at Lafayette College, where he also played football and basketball. This was when Gay had his first interactions with the world of poetry, as he was exposed to it by his professors, Ed Kearns and Lee Upton. Later, Gay would go on to receive his Master's of Art in Poetry from St. Lawrence College and a PhD in English from Temple University. Currently, Gay is an Associate Professor of English and Associate Director of Creative Writing at Indiana University Bloomington. Gay is also an award-winning poet, winning the National Book Critics Circle Award in 2015 and the Kingsley Tuft Award in 2016 for his collection, Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude. The mix between physical art and poetry is clear. Friends of Gay describe his art as an amalgam of words and images, and much like his poetry, it shows a broad cultural expansion and inclusiveness. He has a sophisticated intellectual approach, as opposed to emotional art-based work. The influence of Ed Kearns and Lee Upton can be seen here. As to Gay, a poem is nothing more than a painting created with words, for in the world of poetry, words are the artist's tools, as opposed to paint. Words create the vivid imagery that characterizes his poetry. Gay shares similarities with modernist and imagist writers, such as William Carlos Williams, in that he finds beauty in many areas. Yet he differs, because to Gay there is a difference between a worthy subject and a worthy poem. It is Gay's ability to discern between a worthy subject and a worthy poem that makes each and every one of his poems beautiful and powerful in a unique way. Gay himself has said that he perhaps has 50,000 such worthy subjects, but far fewer worthy poems. Gay also shares similarities with confessional poets and that his poems are almost exclusively narrated by himself in the first person. Every Ross Gay poem makes the reader feel as if they are peeking into his life, as the topics and themes that he writes about can be ones that bring him great joy in life, such as just the weather outside, to more troubling ones, such as his own experience with police profiling and police brutality. Ross Gay is one of the most socially conscious poets writing today. Poetry such as A Small Needful Fact is that Eric Garner worked for some time for the Parks and Rec Horticultural Department, which means perhaps that with his very large hands, perhaps in all likelihood, he put gently into the earth some plants which most likely, some of them, in all likelihood, continue to grow, continue to do what plants do, like house and feed small and necessary creatures, like being pleasant to touch and smell, like converting sunlight into food, like making it easier for us to breathe. Gay is able to humanize Eric Garner in a remarkable way. Most people would only know him for his brutal murder, but Gay reminds the reader that Eric Garner was indeed a person. And you can feel the connection in the poem between Gay and Garner, as gardening is one of Gay's great passions in life, and he has a kinship with this man who planted life for a living. Gay also draws from more personal experience when writing about social issues. He has his own experience with being racially profiled, such as the experience that he details in his poem, Pulled Over in Short Hills, New Jersey, 8am. 
It's the shivering. When rage grows hot as an army of red ants and forces the mind to quiet the body, the quakes emerge. Sometimes just the knees, but at worst through the hips, chest, neck. Until like a virus slipping inside the lungs and pulse every ounce of strength, tap to squeeze words from my taut lips. His eyes scanning my car's insides, my eyes, my license. And as I answer the questions three, four, five times, my jaw tight as a vice, his hand massaging the gun butt, I imagine things I don't want to, and inside beg this to end before the shiver catches my hands, and he sees, and something happens. Short Hills, New Jersey is an affluent suburb of New York City that is 96% white. Gay is detailing an experience of a traffic stop where he was almost certainly racially profiled. While many of his readers may never experience what this feels like, Gay's familiar similes and metaphors allow someone who will never experience such things to have a tiny glimpse of what it would be like. While social issues are a major topic for Gay, he does not limit himself, drawing inspiration from many avenues such as his garden, which he refers to as his obsession, to playing basketball, where he says he has beaten many 12-year-old children. <laughs> his mastery of imagery allows him to use his poetry to paint vivid pictures of these things. The tonal shifts between Gay's poems, or even within, are remarkable. It can transition within poems, with opera singer being a prime example. As you will soon hear, again, Gay's use of vivid imagery, creative similes and metaphors, create what is almost a painting out of words. Today, my heart is so goddamn fat with grief that I've begun hauling it in a wheelbarrow. No, it's an anvil dragging from my neck as I swim through choppy waters swollen with the putrid corpses of hippos, which means lurking somewhere below is the hungry snout of a croc waiting to spin me into oblivion, worse than this run-on simile, which means only to say, I'm sad, and everyone knows what that means. And in my sadness, I'll walk to a cafe and not see light in the trees, nor finger the bills in my pocket as I pass the boarded houses on the block. No, I will be slogging through the obscure country of my sadness and all its monotone flourish. And so imagine my surprise when my self-absorption gets usurped by the sound of opera streaming from an open window, and the sun peeks ever so slightly from behind his shawl, and this singing is getting closer so that I can hear the delicately rolled R's, like a hummingbird fluttering the tongue, which means a language more beautiful than my own, and I don't recognize the song, though I'm jogging toward it, and can hear the woman's breathing through the record's imperfections, and above me two bluebirds dive and dart, and a rogue mulberry branch, leaning over an abandoned lot, drags itself across my face, staining it purple, and looking now like a mad warrior of glee. In relief as I run down the street, I forgot to mention, the fifty or so kids running behind me, some in diapers, some barefoot, all of them winged and waving their pacifiers and training wheels, and nearly trampling me when in the doorway I see a woman in slippers and a floral house dress blowing in the warm breeze who is maybe seventy painting the doorway, and friends, it is not too much to say it was heaven sailing from her mouth, and all of the fish in the sea, and giraffes saunter and sugar in my tea, and the forgotten angles of love, and every name of the unborn and dead, from this abuelita only glancing at me before turning back to her earnest work of brushstroke and lullaby, and because we all know the tongue's clumsy thudding makes a miracle's anecdote, let me stop you and tell you I said thank you. Now, I will allow Roske himself to display his immense skill as an artist. The following poem is called To the Mulberry Tree, and within it, listeners and readers can gain the full breadth of understanding of Roske's poetry from his ability to be incredibly funny 
draw on childhood memories, but also to become far more dark and depressing. The contrast of these images makes for an especially powerful poem. To the mulberry tree. <clears throat> Everyone knows it's good luck, if inconvenient, when a bird shits on you. But even more so good luck if the bird shits on you when you're plucking gold current tomatoes sweet enough to make your bare feet lift just so off the ground. And the beetles beneath scurry and giggle. And as I move to gobble one, mouth agape and swooped in a grin at once, the shit slurries half in. <laughs> and half on my sun-warmed chin, which, forgive me, jiggles me from my reverie, for I'm only human. <laughs> Swiping the slurp of turd from my mouth. <laughs> only to see, only to see it is mostly purple. This goop seedy and gelatinous, and when I see the bird pitching its swill from the branch above, I know that yes, this shit is mostly berry from that most prolific of trees, which some numbskulls call a weed because it's so prolific and not, they say, particularly useful. These same some call insipid the mulberry's flavor, which I think means tasteless or or bland, but given I detect swirled in the shit, the sweet of the thing, insipid doesn't fit the bill, but rather most likely describes the sex life of the describer. But why should I get personal? Defending a tree's honor, mostly I'm happy the birds feast on the topmost branches of these tall trees and leave be for the time being my blueberries and soon blackberries and grapes and these little tomatoes, though to be sure it is a certain glee as spring gasps into summer and the lowest branches shimmer with their simple booty, which I must jump for and sometimes high, which I will not probably always be able to do for jumping and grabbing at once like this. A soft thing is hard. Be gentle, she said, emerging from the dugout beneath the mulberry tree where the big kids gathered. And we mostly rode our bikes by fast so as not to be snatched to the ground and pummeled or worse, for they were teenagers. But I knew this early July morning they would be nowhere to be found and the tree would be burdened with her crop begging to be loosed on my ice cream. She wiped her eyes and yawned and put on glasses and there was in her hair a small sprig of grass and she was barefoot laughing and filling with me slowly my bucket eating a few when it was full, giggling at the small burst of juice one made on her chin and behind her Beneath the tree, there was a filthy blanket and a pack of cigarettes and tinfoil wrappers crumpled and shimmering and the frayed remnants of a rope. And seeing me seen into the terrible future, she put softly one hand on my chin and the other in my hair, turning my head away from what wreckage waited in there and back into the leaves which too I will do to you, so that none of us will ever die terribly, but stay always like this, lips and fingers blushed purple, the faint sugar ghosting our mouths beneath the tree inside me, which is the same tree now grown inside you. The three of us snugged in the canopy on our tippy toes, gathering fruit for good. Who is Ross Gay? What type of poet is he? It's a difficult question to answer, isn't it? Ross Gay draws inspiration from so many different areas, whether it be his more imagist type poems 
about childhood and about playing in the sun, or his poems about social injustice he sees in the world, or he has even seen himself and been the victim of, or perhaps it is the sometimes dark reality that he reflects on in his more confessional poetry. Gabe blends all of these topics, sometimes within the same poem, which makes it difficult to determine what exactly he is. But this is exactly what makes him unique. He does not adhere to just one way of writing. The variety that can be displayed within just a few Ross Gay poems is truly remarkable. And it makes the readers and listeners wonder what does he have in store for the future? Perhaps I have the answer to that question. And as we consider where Ross Gay will go in the future, I thank you for listening. This has been Ross Gay, The Cinematic Experience. Did you ever hear the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the White? No. I thought not. It's not a story the Jedi would tell you. It's a Sith legend. Darth Plagueis was a dark lord of the Sith, so powerful and so wise, he could use the Force to influence the midi-chlorians to create life. He had such a knowledge of the dark side, he could even keep the ones he cared about from dying. He could actually save people from death. The dark side of the Force is a pathway to many abilities some consider to be unnatural. What happened to him? He became so powerful. The only thing he was afraid of was losing his power, which eventually, of course, he did. Unfortunately, he taught his apprentice everything he knew. Then his apprentice killed him in his sleep. It's ironic. He could save others from death but not himself. Is it possible to learn this power? Not from a Jedi.